Good evening. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Matt Naylor, and I serve as the President and CEO at the National World War I Museum, and we couldn't be happier to have you here. You're here in the auditorium and in the lobby space. Welcome. We're glad that you're out for this really important presentation this evening. We're so uh, proud to be partnering with the Midwest Center for Holocaust Education and the National Archives at Kansas City on the eight-part speaker series for State of Deception, the Power of Nazi Propaganda. So welcome. We're glad you're here. I'm very pleased now to introduce to you Ray Doswell, Dr. Ray Doswell, who is uh, who will introduce tonight's speaker. Ray serves as the Vice President for Education at the Midwest Center for Holocaust Education, and during the daytime, he's the Vice President for Curatorial Services at the Negro League's Baseball Museum, a great friend of the museum, a colleague of ours. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Ray to the stage to make the introduction. All right. Good evening. All right, you guys, it's a beautiful summer night in the big city, and you guys came to hear some history. This is fantastic. It gives me hope. I love it. <laughs> so thank you all for coming. On behalf of the board of directors at MCHE, we're very pleased to have all of you here, and we thank you for coming out. And I'm very pleased to welcome uh, tonight's speaker, William Meineke. Uh, Dr. Meineke is no stranger to our region. Uh, he was one of, the four, uh, one, of the, one of our speakers four years ago uh, when the Midwest Center for Holocaust Education presented the traveling exhibition, Deadly Medicine, Creating the Master Race. And just last month, he gave a keynote address at a conference for federal judges in Topeka. Uh, in addition uh, to his talk tonight, he met with over 40 teachers this morning at, a, at an exhibition preview uh, to prepare them for bringing students to the State of De Deception exhibition. And he tells me he will be back in town in a few months as well. So I think we can officially make you a native of Kansas City. <laughs> and he's had the barbecue, so he knows, he knows the deal. <laughs> now, he is uh, originally, though, a Baltimore native who received his undergraduate degree in German and History from the University of Maryland, Baltimore County in 1983. He attended the University of Bonn and Berlin in Germany and received his master's uh, and doctorate in History from the University of Maryland at College Park. Go Terrapins, all right. Fear the turtle. All right. <laughs> Reflecting his interest in the, in the German legal system, uh, the title of his dissertation was Conflicting Loyalties, the Supreme Court in, in Weimar and Nazi Germany, 1918 to 1945. In 1992, he joined the staff uh, of the Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington, D.C., and for the last 12 years has worked with law enforcement officers, judges, prosecutors, attorneys, military officers, and medical professionals as part of the National Institute for Holocaust Education's Outreach to Adult Professionals. Uh, he is the author of the Historical Atlas of the Holocaust, which was published in 1996, Nazi Ideology and the Holocaust in 2007, and Law, Justice, and the Holocaust, which was published in 2010. Let's welcome him back home to the heartland. Please welcome Dr. William Meineke. Thank you so much. Thank you. And, and me, I'm just happy to meet another big man like myself, so I think that's great. We've got to stick together, you know? So I'm in barbecue. The Germans don't have anything like it, so I really enjoyed this afternoon. I have to say that at the very start. And I have to say that it's hotter here than in Washington, D.C. I didn't think I'd see the day, but it seems to absolutely be the case. So I, I tell you, I thought long and hard how best to introduce the, tonight's topic. And I came across something that I think is profoundly important. This is a, I have in my hand a G2 report. Uh, this G2 is counterintelligence. Uh, issued by Shafe, the Supreme Headquarters Allied Expeditionary Force. That was the overall commanding headquarters of British and American forces that were involved in the invasion of Europe and were prepared for the invasion of Germany in about the fall of 1944. So it's undated, but I think it's about the fall of 1944. And they want to make sure American and British forces understand that the Hitler Youth poses a great danger. 
And I brought it with me because I really think the words are powerful and you need to hear what these intelligence officers wrote in their own words. And this is how the report starts. A 13-year-old boy manned a machine gun against advancing Allied tanks on the Rhineland frontier while his mates passed the ammunition. An execution squad composed of 14 to 16-year-olds shot Polish civilian hostages. A monument was erected to a boy still living, commemorating the fact that he had denounced his father's disloyalty to the Fuhrer. His father was executed for treason. Eleven years of Nazi indoctrination at a most susceptible age in the Hitler Youth has done its work. The Hitler Youth is not, underlined, not a Boy Scout or Girl Guide organization. It is in no respect comparable to any organization for young people known to the Western world. It's a compulsory Nazi formation which was consciously sought to breed hate, uh, treachery and cruelty into the mind and soul of every German child. It is in the true sense of the word, quote, education for death, unquote. Under no circumstances should the Hitler Youth be taken lightly or be considered a negligible factor from an operational or occupation point of view. So here, I think they're making great pains to let American and British forces understand that the Hitler Youth aren't the Boy Scouts, that it's not a benign organization, that in fact, they represent the high ideals, the ideological fervor of the Nazi elite. So how did it come to that state and point? How did the Nazi regime win over the youth, win over the ordinary Germans uh, to, the, to the Nazi cause. And that's really the, the topic for tonight. We're going to try to get at that question. It's called Nazi propaganda and the national community in Germany. Now, propaganda, in sort of a very pithy definition, is um, biased information that's disseminated specifically with the intent, intent's very important, to shape public opinion and to impact private actions. So biased information that's disseminated with a specific intent to shape public opinion and to inform private in, the actions of private individuals. The national community in German is called Volksgemeinschaft. It's a horrible translation. Volksgemeinschaft, Gemeinschaft means community, so that, that, I think that translation fits. But Volk in German, it means people, nation, race. Folk has a mystical connotation in German that, it, that the English national community just doesn't have. Folk in German means a people related by a common history, sharing a common blood, that have a common destiny. So it's, it's a very much a mystical community of the nation that they're sharing the same burdens, looking at the same future, sharing the same fate. And I think Nazi propaganda was very much geared to shape that idea of a national community in Germany. It was, if you will, the positive vision that the Nazis proposed to the German people of the future. It was how they tried to win the hearts and minds of the, of the German people. And I wanted to start really by looking at basically three crises that really impacted ordinary Germans before the Nazi rise to power in 1933 to show you sort of what life was like or the perception of what life was like in the imperial period, in, in imperial German under the Kaiser, the experience that they felt under the Republic, and then how Nazi propaganda played right in to that to try to show that they could lead the German people back to that euphoria, back to that utopia of a national community of all united under one leader, uh, Adolf Hitler. And I wanted to start really by looking at Germania. This is a, a painting uh, painted by uh, August, uh, Friedrich August von Kaulbach. It's huge, the dimensions you, you just can't imagine. It's six foot by five foot. Painted on the eve of the First World War and it reflects the self-image of the German nation, Germania is a mythical goddess that reflects and embodies the German nation as a whole. And just look at how she's depicted here. She's powerful, she's tall, she's forceful, she's a warrior Valkyrie, ready to do battle for the nation. She's got a bit of a unibrow, but she's still very serious, very <laughs> determined. She brooks no argument. She knows what she wants, she knows where she's going to get it. She's armed with the shield of the Autonian Reich, so the first uh, German Reich, and she's got the imperial crown of the second German Reich, the Kaiser Reich, steeped in German tradition. Notice that she's looking to the left, she's looking towards France, ready to do battle with France. 
Now, I think it really does embattle how Germans felt about themselves on the eve of the First World War. Germany had won every war it fought for the prior 100 years. Two of the wars were against France. Um, Germany had the largest standing army in Europe. It had certainly um, advanced training, advanced communication system. So the general staff, the Ger a German creation, was seen as the rival of, of any of the major powers in Europe. Advanced industrial society. The second industrial revolution hit Germany, uh, centered in Germany, and Germany is recognized by 1914 as the leading industrial power on the continent of Europe, certainly the most powerful military force, if not the world, certainly on the continent of Europe. Second in population only to the Russian Empire. So clearly the reflection of German confidence, German pride, German power. Right? That's 1914. And I think that's a fair depiction of how Germans felt in 1914. Just six years later, here's Germania again. It's a very different image of the embodiment of the German nation. Germany lost World War I. And this is then their reaction to the treaty, of the peace terms imposed by the victorious Allied powers on Germany. Here, Germania is depicted stripped, not just of her weapons, but also of her, almost all her clothing. She's tied as a martyr to a post uh, she's subject to jackals being set upon her. She's weak, defenseless. She cannot determine not just her own fate, but the fate of her neighbors. She's got no influence, no power, no self-determination. She's prostrate. No hope. At the time, Germans thought the Treaty of Versailles to a man was unfair, and it made Germany artificially weak. The German army is limited to just 100,000 men. Belgium had an army 16 the si six, uh, six times the size of Germany. Poland, 12 times the size of Germany. France, 45 times the size of Germany. In fact, Belgium and French forces occupied the industrial heartland of Germany in 23 when it looked like the country was going to default on reparations payments. And Germany was powerless to oppose it. So that kind of peril is that kind of frustration was an open sore that continued throughout the, throughout the Weimar Republic. And the Nazis capitalized on that. This was a postcard that was, it was three inches by five inches. It says something that the pre-war image of Germania is six foot by five foot. And then the post-war defeated Germania as a three inch by five inch postcard. But sold by the tens of thousands to Germans who really cared that, that their country was prostrate and powerless. And they wanted that to change. Here's how the Nazis capitalized on it. When they came to power, they wasted no effort in proclaiming to the German people how they opposed and overcame the, the restrictions imposed by them by the Treaty of Versailles. Here we see the black swastika tearing through the change that had, uh, that had bound Germania to the post that we had seen. We see that the Hitler is proclaiming that he's tying all Germans, all ethnic Germans, under one state, under the German Reich. Self-determination of peoples was denied to Germany by the Treaty of Versailles. It's granted to everybody else, but denied uh, to the Germans. And here he's saying, not only have we done that, but we've also become an occupying power for a foreign people. Prague is now a German city. Prague is in Czech lands. It's not German at all. But here they can proclaim, look how powerful we are. We are now an equal nation with Britain and France. We are powerful again. We can determine our own fate and we can determine the future of our influence in Europe. Right? That we now have influence again in Central Europe, but also in Southeastern Europe. German power has been restored. The second really transformation that strikes Germans, ordinary Germans, that really, I think, weighs on what they're thinking, is the tremendous transformation, social and economic transformation, that hit Germany in the 1920s. This is Potsdam Square, Potsdamer Platz, Potsdam Square, in the heart of Berlin in 1920. This is the most traveled square on the continent of Europe. And I look at that and I see any downtown square in any village, any small town in Germany. It doesn't look any different. There are horse carts, there are vendors, that, uh, there are deliveries being made by horse-drawn uh, carts, there are um, uh, street cars being drawn by horses, there's a mass of crowds that are doing bartering and selling and walking all over the square. It's actual chaos. 
and it's the heart of downtown Berlin in 1920. Right? I, I, I see no difference from the, the, the central square of a village on market day. That's what it looks like. Very much a tradition-bound society. Within 10 years, this is the same square. So notice here that this building right here is this building right here. And it's a very different view. In just 10 years, Potsdam Square has become the hub of Europe. 600 cars travel every hour through the square. Motorization and electrification hit Germany in the 1920s. Okay, it's at least a decade later than it hit New York or London. But this is the time where there's major transformation about how ordinary people live. To go from this kind of ordered chaos in daily life to this where there are now traffic regulations. There are 500,000 cars in Germany and 100,000 cars being added every year. 150,000 trucks making deliveries. In the homes, electrification and motorization means you, their vacuum cleaners are introduced into German households. The, the, the breakneck pace of change struck people as, as accelerating and increasing. And it made people worry about what the future would bring, that it wasn't so safe and secure anymore. Change is happening much too quickly. And the Nazis, Nazi propaganda tied right into that because they promoted as their ideal this. This is the ideal German family in Nazi propaganda. This is actually a Department of Health poster talking about healthy, healthy parents have healthy children. Right? But look at how they're depicting it. It's a large family, of course, because the Nazis are trying to promote large families. They say they need population growth because in Nazi ideology, they need soldiers and settlers in order to conquer an empire in Eastern Europe. And these people are dressed as farmers. These are peasant, this is a peasant family, emphasizing the values and the virtues of farm life. Even though only a third of Germans still live on the farm, a third live in cities larger than 100,000, and a third live in between. It doesn't have to reflect reality because the Nazis control the press, control what people are hearing, and they're saying, this is our ideal society. They're not trying to reverse urbanization. They're not trying to reverse motorization or electrification. That's accelerating. But publicly, they're proclaiming their ideal is back to the soil, back to blood and soil. And that's really the meaning of blood and soil. Blood, because this is the racial ideal, the blonde hair, fair skin, blue-eyed Nordic type. Uh, hopefully with lots and lots of children. Uh, and then the, the, the soil, the soil part of the ideology is the farmland. That the German, the main plank of the German ideology is to conquer farmland in Eastern Europe for German settlers so that they could return to the ideal as farmers working the land. Right? And that was very reassuring to ordinary Germans that could take a break from the breakneck pace of change, social and economic change, and say they we're reassured because this is traditional values of our society. The, the Nazis are hearkening back to the values of imperial society. And that's really, that, that really resonated with the public. Sort of the last sort of shock I want to, to uh, present to you tonight is this idea of the community under siege. When World War I broke out, suddenly all divisions within German society seemed to disappear. This is a poster that proclaimed what was called the Borg Frieden, the peace of a castle under siege. You can't have fighting when the, when the castle's under attack. And this is very much the way they depicted Imperial Germany with the outbreak of war in 1914. The poster says, Der Kaiser rief und alle alle kamen. The Kaiser called and everyone, everyone came. The petty political squabbles, social differences, cultural class differences, all seemed to be put aside by ordinary Germans because they were all Germans working together for the common good, for the victory of Germany in World War I under the Kaiser. You can imagine then in the Republic, uh, the revolution that overthrew the Kaiser and the establishment of democracy um, destroyed that sense of unity and community. And they, I think they were really struggling to get that back. This, you, you should recognize from the exhibition, it really highlights the myriad of political parties. Elections became political warfare. Parliamentary discussions, voting in parliament, became political warfare. Uh, elections was you know, bloody in the streets. There was no political consensus. No one could agree on what the German government should even be, much less support the republic. 
There were no less than 10 major parties and innumerable smaller splinter parties. To get a majority was nearly impossible. It required lots of compromise, lots of argument back and forth. There were more than 20 governments during the Weimar, the 12 years of Weimar, which meant that the average government lasted about eight years. So government, to me, it sounds like Italy in the, in the 80s. <laughs> you know, every week there's a different Italian government somehow. This is their perception of Weimar, that they're constantly arguing with each other, nobody can agree on anything, and to form a government, you have to abandon your own principles to make an alliance with a party that you really can't stand, that is advocating a political system that you don't want to support. Most Germans became democratic because they called it Republicans of reason. It was the least obnoxious of, of a myriad of obnoxious choices, right? Republicans of reason. And add to that that every party had its own paramilitary fighters that fought in the streets for control of polling places and rallying places. It's not just the people, you know, the, the paramilitary forces that we know. We recognize here, I think we all recognize, the SA and the SS. Those are the paramilitary street fighters of the Nazi party. Well, there's also the Red Front Fighters League, the paramilitary fighters of the Communist Party, and the Reichsbanner League, which is the paramilitary fighters of parties that support the Republic. The Reichsbanner is the flag of the Republic. And then the Stahlhelm, the Steel Helmet League, Steel Helmet Veterans, that supported the National Conservative Party, the German National People's Party. And they're all fighting each other, especially in election time, for control of the streets for control of polling places, to disrupt each other's rallies. Four national elections in 1932, and every time there's bloody street fighting. The, the sense of disorder and disunion and discontinuity in German society was profound, and the Nazis knew exactly how to play into that. This is the Nazi response to that. It's clear, it's precise, it's slogan-esque. One people, one Reich, one government, one leader, one Fuhrer. Adolf Hitler is the embodiment of the nation. He personifies that Borg Frieden from World War I. He can restore that. He symbolizes the unity of the nation. That Volksgemeinschaft, that national community, means the unity under the leadership of Adolf Hitler. And it becomes synonymous, the two, two one. The interest of the Fuhrer is the interest of the nation. The interest of the nation is the interest of the Fuhrer. He publicly portrays himself and he actually did lead a very Spartan life, very simple life. He never marries until the very end because he's dedicated to Germany. He can't waste time on a wife. He has to dedicate himself to Germany's future. And this really then becomes the unity of the nation, one people, one Reich, uh, one leader. And I think that ties right into the national community. Because this is how the Nazis uh, attempt to establish that mystical association where all differences are suppressed by, uh, by individuals in order to become one with the nation. I brought with me a brief film that uses, uh, that uses actual footage from Germany at the time. It's actually part of our, our film called the, the, the Path to Nazi Genocide that you can just download from our, our website. You can view it with any... Uh, internet connection. It's very short. It's only about nine or ten minutes, and I want to play it for you now. Can you start it, please? Can you turn it up, please? The ceremonial reopening of Parliament, orchestrated by Joseph Goebbels, aimed to link the Hitler government to Germany's imperial past and portray the Nazis as saviors of the nation's future. The event was carefully staged to reassure the German establishment, including the military, that Hitler would respect their traditions. Nazi-controlled newsreels then gave the impression that the army supported the new government. Though Hitler walked behind longtime President Hindenburg for now, the new chancellor would soon be Germany's absolute dictator. The day was dedicated to the new Germany, and more than 100,000 schoolchildren stood shoulder to shoulder as the car bearing the aged president and the chancellor proceeded through the crowd to the speaker's stand. 
Whether you agree with his doctrines or not, it must be admitted that the leadership of Hitler has united the German people for the first time since the war. Their almost fanatical enthusiasm is a marvel to the entire world. Hindenburg remained president until his death in August 1934. With Hindenburg gone, Hitler, by agreement with the army, abolished the office of president, declaring himself Führer and Reich Chancellor, leader of the nation and head of the government. Now there was no authority above or beside him. Immediately, the armed forces swore an oath of allegiance to Adolf Hitler. All civil servants, including teachers and police, members of parliament and the judiciary, swore an oath of loyalty not to any constitution, but to Hitler as Führer of the German nation. The economy had reached rock bottom when the Nazis came to power. They boosted its recovery with huge public works projects for the unemployed. Halbe Million erwerbsloser Volksgenossen wurden in diesem Jahr an den Arbeitsplatz zurückgeführt. Seit der Machtübernahme ist die Arbeitslosigkeit um 61 von 100, also um weit über die Hälfte, zurückgegangen. Hitler christened new Autobahns triumphantly in a display of national will that would unite the country and facilitate the secret expansion of Germany's armed forces. In 1935, Germany openly defied the 1919 Treaty of Versailles by reinstituting the draft and increasing its military strength. The Nazis were delivering on their promises to restore and strengthen the nation. Their achievements encouraged many people to overlook radical Nazi policies, or even to support them. In September 1935, the Nazi party gathered in Nuremberg for its annual rally. It opened with a traditional hymn that added solemnity and a sense of continuity with the past. It ended with a special session of parliament far from Berlin. New race laws were introduced by Hitler and read by parliament president Hermann Goering. The Nazi regime aimed to create a racially pure Germany whose so-called superior traits would make it ideally suited to rule the entire European continent. Nazism taught that racial struggle was the driving force in history. Superior races must battle inferior races or be corrupted by them. The Nazi concept of a national community was exclusive and based on race, as defined in the new laws and decrees. Heinrich Himmler and the SS led the ideological battle. Racist ideas were taught in schools. Some groups, such as Jews, Slavs, Blacks, and Roma, also called Gypsies, were labeled racially inferior. People with mental or physical disabilities were designated unworthy of life. Scientists and medical professionals applied pseudo-scientific theories for measuring and valuing racial characteristics. I think that's a great summary of the national community that the Nazis were trying to create and the purpose of that, that that is really a cornerstone of Nazi ideology and it's a centerpiece of Nazi ideology. But I want to take time now to look closer at how this is then constructed over time. And I want to start with this definition. 
you know, I think the definition is really very precise and very clear that it reflects the nat this national community. Remember that folk, that mystical folk um, unity, the unity of the community is the people of the whole without the traditional divisions that mar German society of the past. The division between North and South, which seems to be everywhere in Europe and here in the United States, that division between what people are typically like in the North versus what people are typically like in the South, regional differences, whether it's Bavaria and Schwaben versus Prussia uh, in the north, religious differences, you know, Germany is divided along uh, religious lines between Lutherans in the north and Catholics in the south and the west. All of that was going to fall by the wayside. And instead, that they were to think of themselves as one nation under the leadership of the Nazis. It included all race-conscious Aryan Germans. They have to accept and obey and conform to the demands of Nazi ideology on one hand, but also to German social norms the traditional values of German society on the other. And how this was constructed from the very first in 33 was by the inclusion of all classes of society in Nazi organizations. So all private associations are dissolved and typically all youth go into the Hitler Youth and all adults either go into the SA, the SS, or the Women's League. So I think this is very important because it, it, it loosens family ties and regional allegiances because these are national organizations, they're wearing uniforms, they meet at least once a week, often several times a week, they also have civic projects that they work on, so that there's very much less time spent between family members. And you know, if you know me, you know I love period jokes that actually get at the heart of something important historically. And the joke that was actually circulating in 1933 at the time was with dad in the SA, mom in the, uh, and, uh, the Nazi Women's League, Big brother in the Hitler Youth, little brother in the Young Folk, big sister in the Bund, uh, the Federation of German uh, Girls, and little sister in the G German Girls League. The only time we actually have family time is the yearly Nazi party rally in Nuremberg. <laughs> <laughs> because they're all going their separate ways in different directions, and they're exposed at least once a week to Nazi ideological indoctrination. To to what was called uh, association evenings, where they would sit together with a leader of their unit that would then explain to them the importance of what the national community means and sacrificing individual wants and needs for the benefit of the community as a whole. Right? So that's, I think that is a very important first step because then it's an ongoing conditioning over time. Right? And Hitler also said, and I think this is very profound, will get the youth at 10 years old. That's when you, you, they enter the young folk, the, the youngest members of the Hitler Youth, at 10 years old, and will never let them go. Because the normal transition is from the young folk to the Hitler Youth, to the Reich Labor Service, to the Army Service, and then right into the SA or the SS. So if they get them at 10, they'll have them their whole lives. They'll be subject to Nazi ideological conditioning their entire life. I think that goes a long way to understanding that G2 report in the very beginning, right? The, the counterintelligence report saying these aren't the Boy Scouts. You have to be very careful when you're dealing with, uh, with the Hitler Youth. And, you know, Victor Klemperer, a survivor from Saxony, he mentioned in his diaries at the time that in 33, suddenly everyone's wearing a uniform. They become ubiquitous. They're everywhere. This is a commuter bus in Berlin. And you can see that uniformed people are sitting right next to uh, upper middle class people going to their daily jobs. And the thing about uniforms, Nazi society was a society of uniforms. It strips a person of their individuality. Suddenly you become part of a national organization. And because it's the Volksgemeinschaft where you're not supposed to pay attention to class differences or regional differences or differences of wealth, often you're in a hierarchy where your social inferior is giving you orders and ordering you around. So when you look, I look at this bus, I see, and this is, I, I've read numerous um, uh, reports and, and memoirs of the time period, that it's almost always the case that you're being ordered by someone who's really socially beneath you. Um, so I like to think of this bus as upper middle class people suddenly have to worry about getting orders from working class blue collar workers that are wearing uniforms saying that they represent the Nazi party on a national level. Right? And this is happening on a daily basis. This is a normal commuting day. 
At the same time, from the very beginning, they define the national community by who's not a member of the body politic of the nation. This is a, actually a, a photograph from Der Sturmer, the Nazi anti-Semitic rag uh, uh, that produced weekly in Germany. And it's a man, if you can see him in the center, he's carrying a sign, if you can read it, that says, who buys from Jews is a traitor to the people. So again, setting up Jewish Germans as being different from non-Jewish Germans, they're separate people, and if you buy from a, a Jewish-owned store, you are a traitor to your own people. Now, for me, that's relatively a benign kind of, of, of segregation, segregating Jews out from the body policy of the nation. I think this, this is actually much harsh, much more harsh and much more typical. This is Dr. Michael Siegel, a prominent Jewish attorney in Munich. He had heard that one of his clients had been arrested in one of the, the raids that the police were, were conducting in the state of emergency following the attack on the German Reichstag uh, in Berlin. And he went to the police headquarters. He did what lawyers do. He asked the desk sergeant there that he'd like to speak with his client. He'd like to know what the police were going to charge him with. He'd like to know the evidence they have or would be prepared to present in court. And he'd like to begin building the case of the defense of his client. He's tr t treated very politely by the desk sergeant but he's told he's wanted downstairs. And this is police headquarters in Munich. And he's met on the stairwell by these stormtroopers, the street fighter thugs of the Nazi party, who have taken off their armbands that said auxiliary policemen and are now purely a party unit. And they begin to beat him to a pulp. They knocked out one of his front teeth, they perforated his eardrum. Worse, I mean, that's being beaten up in private. That's bad enough. Worse for Dr. Siegel is they ripped his trousers and took his shoes and socks and marched him to the center of Munich with a sign around his neck that said he would never again complain to the police. Now, this was bad enough if it's a singular event targeting uh, Dr. Siegel, but this is happening all over Germany. As stormtroopers, these street fighter thugs of the Nazi party, attack courts all over Germany in an attempt to try to force this sort of non-Nazi administration in, in Germany to recognize that Jews are not German and should not be civil servants of the state. Right? They take a seated judge in the middle of proceedings at the Superior Court in Cologne, load him into a trash truck and haul him off to police headquarters. I mean, he's released, but by then the damage is done. People have seen this judge uh, derided as a Jew and being loaded into a trash truck and hauled off. I think that's a very stark lesson to non-Jewish Germans, that Jews are not members of the body politic of the nation, that they are outsiders, and they are enemies, enemies of the nation. And I think that message is the earliest. It begins right away in 1933, and is probably the most consistent message that's issued as part of this national community. Defining the national community is in part defining who doesn't belong and then making sure that the public sees them getting separate treatment, different treatment, that they are publicly humiliated and debased. The most ubiquitous habit that the Nazis instilled in Nazi Germany, again, right away from 1933, was this uh, so-called German greeting. The, the practice of not saying good morning or good evening or uh, good day or hello, but instead you substitute the German greeting, which is Heil Hitler and you raise your right arm at a 45 degree angle. That became ubiquitous. This is just one sign that's hung in public places. Uh, and the German is, it, it sounds so much better in German because it rhymes. Volksgenosse trittst du ein, so dein Gruß Heil Hitler sein. Right, it sounds almost like a German rhyming fairy tale. Uh, but the English is a little more cumbersome. And it's important that it's Heil Hitler. In, in part, it harkens back to a Roman greeting, Hail, Hail Hitler. But the German word, the root is heilig, and heilig means holy. So there is a religious, mystical connotation there as well. And it became everywhere in German society, even mandated uh, by the civil service. What you, what you see here are um, priests, judges, doctors, nurses, military officers, police officers, teachers, all giving the Heil Hitler salute. It becomes everywhere, and you say it multiple times a day. You say it when you meet a friend on the street. You say it when court opens sessions. You say it when class begins. It becomes part and parcel with daily life. And having to say that every day is a daily commitment to support the Nazi German state. Heil Hitler. It's not to say that there wasn't some nonconformity. There was. 
that this national community that the Nazis are trying to create is still largely myth. Do you see the gentleman that I'm referring to? Yeah? He's hard to miss. He's standing here right in the middle, and everyone else is giving the Heil Hitler, and he's got his arms folded. So visually refusing to give the Heil Hitler salute. This is actually uh, dock workers in Hamburg. They're there to greet Hitler, who's come because Hitler's going to launch the new uh, marine uh, training ship, the Horst Vessel. And they're all supposed to say Heil Hitler. Now, funny enough, after the war, a Hamburg you know, newspaper advertised. They wanted to know who that gentleman was and why he refused to give the Heil Hitler salute. And they got two responses to the request. And both of them are rational and they make perfect sense. Uh, one claimed that that was their father, and the reason why he's not giving the Heil Hitler salute was that he had fallen in love with a Jewish woman. And this is 1936, the Nuremberg Laws are 1935, and because of the Nazis passing the Nuremberg Laws, he couldn't marry her, and this outraged him. He went on to live with her in sin, he had two children by her, um, but he refused categorically ever to give the Heil Hitler salute. Now, he's talked to by Voss and Sons. They're the firm that actually built the horse vessel. And he's told that you can't do that. You can't publicly stand there and just cross your arms and not give the Heil Hitler salute. That's waving a red flag in front of Nazi hooligans. And he simply refused to hear it. He's reprimanded time and again, but he's never fired because he's a needed skilled laborer. They had skills that the company needed. So they just kept reprimanding him and talking to him, but he kept refusing to give the Heil Hitler salute. The second person that identified that man actually as her father um, said that he was an ardent Christian and he simply, out of religious conviction, could not give the Howell Hitler salute. Now, I've seen, granted, this is post war testimony, so it's, for me it's always a little bit dubious, but lots of Germans who said that they witnessed um, the requirement to give the German salute at the beginning of class or the beginning of court that the person who's leading it is slurring it in a way that makes it clear to everyone present that they don't really like doing it and they're not really supporting it. Teach some teachers who made sure that always they had books in both arms so they couldn't do the salute and then mumbled, how, how, that was Heil Hitler? Right? So they're clear that they're signaling that they're not really supporting the state. Or meeting a friend on the street and both of you are pretending you don't really know them so you don't have to greet them and say Heil Hitler in public. I mean, so there's that kind of nonconformity. But it's hard, it's hard to re reject the power and the importance of peer pressure. When you're standing in a crowd like that, and everyone is saying Heil Hitler and doing the, the arm salute, and you're not, that's a hard thing to stand by and do. It's a hard thing to do. Not that there are any consequences. It's not against the law not to give the Heil Hitler salute, but it becomes a social norm. And there's tremendous peer and social pressure to do it and conform. This is another way the Nazis tried to build this sense of uh, every individual person being one with the national community. This is a mass event that's called Harvest Festival in Buchenberg. It was held in a field just south of Hanover in northern Germany. This is an event, it's every year, it's always the first Sunday in October. It's meant to celebrate the harvest. They had more than a million farmers come every single year to this mass event. It's one of the three mass events that are held on a yearly basis. It's the Harvest Festival for Farmers. It's May 1st, May Day for workers, but they, they can come and celebrate the working classes. And then it's the Nazi Party Rally in Nuremberg. So there's three mass events. And there are constant reports. I've never been part of one of these mass events, but I've been in a, in a baseball stadium where the, that group Creatures is created, where there's no individual anymore. The whole crowd is, acts as one person. And to see that in a field of millions, again, it's that kind of sublimation of the individual in the masses of the many. It's hard to see an individual anymore. They're just a mass of people. A mass that are stirred to a frenzy by the arrival of their leader, Adolf Hitler, the leader of the nation, the embodiment of the national community. Uh, this becomes then a yearly um, striving to touch him, to touch the great leader. Right? Three times a year, three different audiences, all aimed at creating this kind of mass fervor, mass acclamation and adoration of the leader of the nation, Adolf Hitler. They tried to stir a sense of community by holding public dinners. This was a, a, a campaign that went on throughout the, throughout the pre-war years. They said, look, Germans who really have their biggest meal of the week, Sunday noontime, 
that's usually a multi-course, big family meal, very expensive, usually fine cuts of meat. Instead of holding this feast on Sunday, why don't you just have a, a stew, a one-pot dinner? And then the money that you save from not laying out the full spread, donate to charity to help your fellow folk citizen, a, f a fellow a person of the nation. What you see here is a mass event sponsored by the uh, Nazi charitable organization that says, well, come to this stew supper this Sunday in, in Nuremberg. They have really the entire town practically centered in the middle of Nuremberg, uh, having one of the, the stews. And then they're collecting boxes, people standing around with collecting boxes all around, so that you donate the difference in what you would have paid for one of these multi-course Sunday feasts uh, to the charitable, charitable organizations. And even Hitler gets involved. He's here, this is a propaganda photograph that's really spread through the German news. Hitler himself is taking part in the Stew Sunday, so you can be one with the nation. Now, I have to say, they still continued to collect for their less well-off folk comrades after Germany had chained uh, full employment in 1937, and they actually had more, job, uh, more jobs announced than they had applicants seeking the job. And they're still collecting for the unemployed so that, that you can help them better them and be part of the folk community. Um, they collected quite a bit of money. I think in just October 1938, they collected 35 million Reichsmarks, which is a hefty sum of, of cash. All for the Nazi charitable organization, right? Uh, again, trying to foster that national community saying, well, women are the most important citizens of the nation. Hitler said publicly numerous times, women are the most important citizens of the nation because they are wives and mothers, and we have to honor them. This is called Mothering Sunday, or Mother and Child Day. It's usually the first Sunday in, in May. And it's, besides these parades and ceremonies, there are uh, crosses awarded, mothering crosses awarded to mothers who have large families. So you get the Gold Mother's Cross awarded to you publicly in a, in a great ceremony where the, the state, sometimes Hitler personally, is praising you to high heaven because you've born eight children. Right? You get a gold medal cross for eight or more children. I, I would prefer actually to have less. <laughs> That's just me. So you can see how they're trying to foster this community of mutual concern. It's no longer individual or family concern, but you're talking about your fellow person, talking about society as a whole, and mothers as wives and mothers, I mean women as wives and mothers, as uh, required to renew the nation, as guardian of the racial health of the nation. Uh, women are praised. Sport became a national fascination under, under Nazi Germany. The idea that Germans should be fit, that's part and parcel with Nazi ideology. It's part of creating a more martial society. Because remember, Germans have to wage war to seize territory in the East to create this German empire of 200 million Germans from the Rhine to the Urals. That's the ideal goal. Germans are, after all, the master race. They're going to rule Europe. Uh, and that means they have to be physically fit. So these kinds of co uh, coordinated public displays of calisthenics became everywhere in German society. Sports competition became important. Sports became a mandatory subject in school. It became a mandatory testing subject for, the, for graduation school, the, the so-called abitur, the school leaving exam. The gym instructor became vice principal of the school, raising then the prestige and the level of sports uh, to an extreme. Interstate competition, inter divisional competition between Hitler youth units became a prime way not just to promote physical fitness, but to promote civic pride and pride in the nation. Mm -hmm. Part and parcel, sports for a political motive, for political objective. Uh, I love this uh, whole idea. This idea is great. Would you ever expect to see a, a picture like this talking about Nazi Germany? <laughs> it seems so incongruous, right? This is part of the strength through joy program. Again, remember the national community means that the divisions of social class have no meaning anymore. You're all Germans, we're all in the same boat. We all have to help each other and care for each other. We have to lift everybody up to be part of the national, national unity of the nation. And the Strength Through Joy program is actually a, a relaxation uh, holiday program that's targeting blue collar workers, steel workers, armaments workers, and the like, that they and get um, opportunities for relaxation. This is 
exercise on the public beach in Wannsee, it's the, the beach uh, resort suburb of Berlin, that to call in these blue collar workers so they can have relaxation and an opportunity to get sun and, and swim in the sea. There are holidays sponsored by the Strength Through Joy organization where they send blue collar workers on state subsidized cruises on the East Sea. Uh, and up to 10 million Germans a year are taking part in these Strength Through Joy uh, exercises. It'd be enormously popul popular, and it really helped cement this idea that the state is there for every social class, for everyone in society. Um, you can imagine a full symphony playing a, uh, a, a Strauss concert in a steel mill. This is what Strength Through Joy did in order to promote the cultural development of working class that help elevate them as part of the body politic of the nation. Enormously popular. During the war, this crystallized into, into Hitler worship, into the Hitler mystique, the, the Hitler myth, especially after the military victories, this whole string of military victories from 1939 really to 1941 with the initial invasion of the Soviet Union, but especially with the victory over France. I mean, think about it, Germany fought six years in World War I, primarily against France, and was fought to a standstill. And Germany had to surrender in World War I. Here, the German army conquered France, forced France into, into making an armistice and signing an armistice in just six weeks. There was euphoria that struck Germany that Hitler was somehow this mystical leader that could do no harm. This is a, a glorying, glorifying portrait of Hitler the war leader the mystical incarnation of the national community who can do no wrong, who's a military genius that will lead Germany to this wonderland of empire from the Rhine to the Urals. Uh, it's really very stirring, very profound, and incredibly wrong, or incredibly mis misleading, especially since it's exactly at this time where Germany seems the most victorious that actually the Holocaust is unleashed. This is German anti-Jewish propaganda inside Germany, where they're saying not only are they not a member of the body politic of the nation, but they are the enemy within. They're in league with our enemies without. So consequently, when Jews are deported from Germany beginning in the fall of 1941, the reaction of the German people is either indifference or they're pleased that they're being deported. Now, I have to tell you, this is, this is happening in, in full view of the public. It's a deportation from a major city in Würzburg. It's a big city in northern Bavaria in the south of Germany. It's happening in full view of the city. This is not a secret de a deportation. Um, they've been ordered to assemble, and the police there are leading them to the railhead where there will board trains to the east. And I have to tell you, I found in a German police journal, so this is a weekly or monthly magazine that's targeting police officers, and in there, there was a cartoon that explained the deportation this way. It was, the police are making the fairy tale forest safe for Hansel and Gretel. And it depicted the wicked witch with a Star of David on her cap being manhandled by two police officers leading her out of the forest. Now think of that imagery. They're making the fairy tale forest safe for Hansel and Gretel. That's how they're depicting and explaining the deportation. The reaction of most Germans is, they're Jews, it has nothing to do with me, I'm not Jewish. Maybe I'll be able to get some cheap household goods out of the deal. Or maybe I'll be, have access to an apartment, maybe that's something good that will come out of it. But for the most part, it has nothing to do with me, I don't have to deal with it. And I, you, know, you may want to avert your eyes, this is the harshest image that I'm going to show you today, but we are talking about the Holocaust, and it is the, the mass murder, the massacre of people. So these people were being deported either to these open air massacre sites in the east where they would be shot by German police officers and SS officers, or to killing centers in occupied Poland where again, they're under the control of the police and the SS, and they're being killed in fixed gas, uh, gas chambers uh, using uh, asphyxiation as a means of, of murder. And it's happening under Hitler's authority as head of state. Hitler, the genius war leader, he's the one who's authorizing this and enabling it to happen. And I think German propaganda depicting Jews as not members of the body politic of the nation 
aids that, understores that, and supports that. As Germany begins to lose the war, especially after their defeat in Stalingrad in 1943, they begin to, uh, to marshal the resources of the nation. And here we have uh, both the campaign poster here for the, the storm of the people. This idea that the body politic of the nation will take arms and defend the country from its enemies without. The reality is seen here in the, in the image. It's mainly old men and very young boys that are armed with obsolete rifles and maybe you know, the German bazooka called a Panzerfaust. And then they're sent to face American and Soviet tanks. They are slaughtered by the tens of thousands. They are going basically uh, to their deaths. At the same time, and again, I, I've been having the theme of what, what children are doing, what the youth are doing. Um, the youth are becoming, some youth are fed up with the constant regimentation, the constant demands for sacrifice, the constant demands for duty of the Nazi state of the Hitler youth. They've dropped out. They've formed their own associations. They refuse to wear uniforms. And they run to the woods where they can just have fun with their friends. In, in the Rhineland, they're, they're called uh, Edelweiss pirates. So the pirates of the you know, white flower of Austria. In Berlin and in, in Hamburg, they're called the Swing Youth, where they don zoot suits and play English music, jazz music, and dance. All they want to do is dance. It's not political, particularly. They're just tired of the constant regimentation and ideological conditioning of the Nazi state. In Dresden and in parts of Saxony, they call themselves Navajos and do the same thing. They drop out of the Hitler Youth and spend their time beating up the Hitler Youth and stealing their equipment and then just partying and having fun. Right? The Nazis tried to suppress this, but it was way bigger than they could possibly suppress. Right? A few hundred youth were sent to youth re-education camps as late as 44, um, but to no avail. Typically, this is much more the fate of Hitler Youth that were committed to the Nazi cause complete disillusionment when they face actually hardcore fighters of the American, British, and Soviet armies. I mean, I look at that face and I see complete disillusionment, complete defeat, utter defeat. And in fact, Germans see the evidence of their defeat all around them. German cities were 80 to 90 percent destroyed completely. Berlin especially, Hamburg and Dresden had firestorms that destroyed whole city blocks. You cannot help but see the, the defeat of Germany all around you. And I think this is great evidence of the ultimate disillusionment of ordinary Germans with the Nazi regime. This is graffiti written on a destroyed house in Cologne. And the graffiti is really very illuminating. It says, 20 years of stuff, a happy marriage, everything gone to hell. Well, the Germans actually were more profane, but I didn't want to use profanity here, so I, I cleaned it up a little bit by saying everything's gone to hell. Um, total of four brothers and a father dead. That's the reality of the result of the Nazi regime for many ordinary Germans, that they, their families have been, also have been destroyed, their homes have been destroyed, their property have been destroyed. And once uh, uh, General Eisenhower begins the dissemination of information about what was going on in the concentration camps, by ordering German townspeople from go, uh, to, to go through concentration camps and to actually witness the state of affairs in these concentration camps in, in the May 1945, to put up public information centers where they have pictures of the camps in the hearts of major German cities, I think the two together completely discredit the Nazi regime and this drive for a national community. This idea of the Nazis have led basically to the destruction of Germany on one hand, and they committed horrible crimes against humanity on the other. So thank you very much. For you. Ladies and gentlemen, we have an opportunity for some question and answer with Dr. Meineke. Particularly if you are outside in the auditorium lobby, we would invite you to come inside. There are two microphones at the bottom of either set of stairs, and uh, it's a great opportunity to ask an expert um, after a fantastic... I kind of like leaving that up. I think it's a nice backdrop of the total disillusionment, total destruction that the Nazis brought. 
No questions? You all understand uh, There everything? is. There's one up. Uh, <laughs> actually, if you'd like to go ahead and, and stand up at that microphone. And if you want to come down here, or if I need to, I can come up to you. That great presentation, by the way. Thank you so much. Oh, I appreciate he's that. Start first. Uh, my question, and I, I've done a little bit of the reading on this. You know, um, it was largely held that that world did not respond to this, uh, that this uh, destruction of life that occurred uh, in the concentration camps, it wasn't really thought through very well by, by the Americans, by maybe by the, the free world. And my thoughts were that when people began to realize how powerful Germany was, it took the United States four years to get their act together because when they were bombed in Pearl Harbor, they had no clue that they had that sort of force against them. Right. We were, we were the only major power that had completely disarmed. <laughs> and, yeah, and that's, I guess maybe that I'd like to address that because, one, I, uh, I, I mean, I certainly have a tremendous passion for the loss of life there. I hate, hate, but I also want to respect the fact that we did a great job of, my father was in that war too, of fighting back and stopping that. So is our question in there, or is that just It a was really to, to, to concur with that idea that, uh, you know, it took a great deal of manpower and thought power to put together the forces that actually stormed the beaches in Normandy, because right. just, th you know, just asking him to stop... Well, you, you know, the museum in Washington, we're all about complicating things and really posing questions and not really answers. So I, I, have, I have an example for you that really poses the dilemma. When... Um, when, for example, uh, American Jews, Jewish leaders, went to Roosevelt and said, please bomb Auschwitz. This is, this is the late summer 1944. The, apparently, Auschwitz was in range of American bombers stationed in Italy, and this was the perfect opportunity to do it. You know, Roosevelt passed the, the idea on to the military staff, and they had to do a feasibility study. And basically, they had already decided back in 41 that no resources would be diverted for rescue, that the, really the only way to rescue seriously uh, people threatened by the Nazi regime was to destroy the Nazi regime as fast as possible. So all our resources were to be devoted to destroying Nazi Germany as fast as possible. So they didn't even look at it. They simply said, no, rejected on, on military feasibility grounds. When the time came to help the insurgents in the Warsaw Polish uprising in the summer of 1944, that's a whole different issue because suddenly Poland was our ally in 39, or the ally of the British in 39. It became an important political decision to help them. And lo and behold, we diverted military resources to drop supplies to the insurgents in Warsaw. So I would point out that both were possible. One, we didn't have the political will. The other, we did have the political will. And why that is bothers me. I don't have the answer to it, but it bothers me. Your next question will come from this side over here. Was Hitler himself the mastermind of the propaganda machine, the total immersion propaganda machine? Well, if, if you look in, in the exhibit, um, uh, if you look in State of Deception, there are quotes from Mein Kampf where he talks about the nature of propaganda and what good propaganda is. But clearly, the mastermind behind this concerted public campaign in Germany is Goebbels. Goebbels really, really refined the techniques of propaganda on that kind of scale. And he often set the policy of what, you know, what would be disseminated to the German public. So I think the two working hand in hand, absolutely. And remember, too, that Hitler was very concerned about public opinion in Germany. So there, was, there were thousands of what he called V-men, Faumena. These were trusty, trustworthy individuals who wrote weekly reports to the Nazi regime about the opinion of people they were working with or living next to. Didn't have to mention names, it just said, you know, steel workers in Cologne really didn't like your last speech about, you know, farm, uh, uh, farm policy. And here's why. So just that he had his pulse on the public opinion of the nation. But while the Nazis were a dictatorship, Hitler wanted to be a popular dictator. He really th thought of himself as being the personification of public will. He didn't want to be, he didn't want to force it down Germans' throats. They were the body politic of the nation. He wanted them to see that he was right and to support him. It's, it's a very bizarre relationship as far as I can see. Good question, thank you. Do you, do you see any of the uh, any parallels in our society today, uh, particularly maybe in, in uh, uh, the, the maybe political correctness, uh, or even in education, uh, the common core? 
Well, you're asking a historian a question about the current day, and we're very bad at those kind of questions. I, 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 I really try not to see correlations today because I'm so full of the minutia of the past that I always see differences. So I really rely on the public to voice connections that they see. And then I can think about them for a while and decide whether that's legitimate or not legitimate. So I'm going to, I'm going to take a punt and punt that question. If you don't that was mind. a discerning answer. <laughs> so. uh, what was going on at German universities? How was propaganda used there? Was there any more resistance oh, to German universities, German universities than elsewhere? Universities. Or do they just all fall for it? One of the, one of the pictures I showed of during the Heil Hitler was actually at, the, at a university with a esteemed physician leading a class in anatomy. It was the Goetz, Professor Goetz. Uh, so his students were all doing the Heil Hitler. He was wearing an SS uniform, for God's sakes, doing the Heil Hitler. University and the student movement, they're inculcated in Nazi ideology. They're a center of Nazi ideology. So uh, they're, they're by no means a neutral force in German society. They're part and parcel with it. They're also the ones, for example, that organized the book burning in May 1933. They did it on their own initiative under their own authority. Any one notion of, of German science, as a, you know, for example, like Lysenko, any comparisons there? The, the only comparison that I, I would make at this point because there is, there's always a connection between scientific research and study and political and cultural ideas that are current at the time, is that physics, German physics was set back a decade because Hitler regarded physics as a Jewish science. Because of Enrico Fermi and Albert Einstein, well, of course, Jews deal with, with that. It's a Jewish thing. We don't need to worry about that so much. Right? We benefit from that, so I'm not going to say it was really a bad thing. I mean, thank goodness they didn't develop the bomb, right? So very much those cultural factors fit right into that. Uh, one thing that didn't get mentioned is the big lie, the repetition of something over and over, and the assumption of people hearing it that, well, if they keep repeating it, it must be true. I can uh, give you... Not unlike what we seem to find going on in this country right now. So can, can, can you give me an example from the history of a great lie that the Nazis repeated over and over again? Well, I mean, certainly you touched on the... the uh, desecration of Jews. The that Jews are not members of the German nation. Absolutely. That's one of the great lies that repeated often enough. And I think that's really the propaganda war that the Nazis won. They convinced most ordinary Germans that Jews were not part of the body politic of the nation. Even though before the Nazi rise to power, German Jews were invisible and equal members of German society. So I think you're absolutely right there, sir. He's, he's walking away and I'm saying he's right. <laughs> so, no. Other questions or comments? Um, hi, I want to thank you for your talk tonight. It was very informative. Um, I appreciate you talking about kind of the civilian aspect of it, that they weren't all part of the military. And so I was wondering which was more of the priority or if that priority changed over the years from civilian education and trying to create national community versus trying to recruit them into Hitler Youth and the military and the SS, right. where their priorities were and if that changed over time. Hitler and the military saw that all as part and parcel of making Germany a more martial state. That the Hitler youth not only would be physically fit, they would also have military conditioning, they would be trained to shoot. Um, in fact, I could have shown you a photograph of uh, schoolboys at school during gym throwing mock hand grenades as a school sport. We're talking really overt military training incorporated into basic education because they saw the Hitler Youth as feeder units into the German army and into the SS. Mm -hmm. So they saw it as all part and parcel of the same thing. That's why the emphasis on public fitness, not just in the youth, but also, uh, unfortunately, academics under 50 had to go through rig rigorous physical conditioning. It would just mm -hmm. kill me. I just would not, <laughs> I would not be able to do that, no. But that was the idea. Aryan Germans, they're superior in mind and body. They must be physically fit. And that's emphasized all across the board. Okay. All right. Can I can I amend my question really quick sure. then? Um, I guess my 
more to my point, um, was there a division in trying to take people from the blue collar workers and recruit them into the military, or did they were, did they struggle with the idea of that they needed those people to be in the factories and to create these jobs? Um, how did they struggle with that? That tension really continued through the whole period, okay. where you know the army demanding more and more bodies because, especially after the invasion of the Soviet Union, when German losses mounted uh, exponentially that they tried to really squeeze those resources. But skilled laborers were hard to replace mm -hmm. because really the only forced laborers that had the skills they needed to produce the kind of sophisticated weapons that they were making were Jewish skilled laborers and they were targeted to be killed. They were killed last, but they were still killed. Right, because not the ideology, the German state was stronger if Jews weren't present in it. Thank you. You're very welcome. Great job. Yes, sir. I, do, I do have what I hope is a quick question, because uh, I don't know their biographies. Uh, it's one thing for Hitler and Goebbels to uh, take propaganda or the tradition of propaganda and try to perfect it, for lack of a So what tradition word. are you referring to? Oh, well, that, well, that's what I want to know, is where did they learn it? Uh, and then how did, uh, how did they take it? How, where did they learn it and make the decision to give it the, the, its height for their purposes and to, um, uh, and to be so efficient with it, I guess. Hitler and Goebbels were profoundly influenced by the success of Allied anti-German propaganda in World War I. That they thought that the Allies were much more successful as painting Germans as, as evil conquerors and as beasts that were you know, raping and killing uh, Belgian women and children. And that he really thought that it was the failure on the German side of not having a concerted propaganda that would promote the unity of the nation supporting German forces that led to the revolution and the defeat in World War I. And he swore that that would not happen again. Did that answer your question? So they're really looking really concertedly at how the Allies marshaled public opinion against Germany in World War I. And our last question will come from this side of the room. Oh, yes. I guess I'm the last question. All right. Cool. <laughs> So uh, my question was, uh, with the propaganda, you talked about you know, the Jewish propaganda. Anti-Jewish propaganda, yeah. Yeah, and I was wondering with, um, I mean, Hitler was against you know, a, a, a wide range of different classes, you know, Catholics, Christians, blacks, Aryans. Oh, he was that. a multifaceted bigot. Yeah, you know, so, okay. so I, was wondering, I was wondering, did they have like, a special propaganda for specific groups like that? Like, I mean, we just saw a couple posters and stuff like that. Did they have like, a mainstream propaganda yeah. like that. The center core of Nazi ideology is uh, racial anti-Semitism. And if Hitler talked about the issue in public, it was always about Jews. Hitler's obsessed with Jews. He thinks Jews are you know, the epitome of this sort of evil race that's bent on the destruction of civil society. He saw that was their biological purpose through time, was to promote the dissolution and decay of structured civil societies. Uh, the level of the discrimination against other groups in German society happens a level below Hitler. It really happens with the police leadership, people like Himmler and Heydrich, that really have, for example, whole offices that combat various targeted groups. There is the uh, office within the state secret police that, that so this is the way they put it, targets the gypsy menace, right? There is the office to combat homosexuality and abortion. Think about that for a minute. Why would they combine a police office that was assigned to attack both illegal abortions and male homosexual activity. Because <laughs> the Nazi thinking, it's really primarily a population problem. Right? They lost two million German men in World War I. They need men to father children as fast as possible because they have to populate the German East. And the only way to do that would be to force them back into the closet so that they then have sham marriages where they father children, and then you prevent German women from aborting them. Right? So it's happening at the level of the police, and they're all using that kind of logic centered around Nazi ideology that comes from Hitler. Right? If this is true for Jews, well, this group is similar to Jews in that respect, so we must target them for that reason as well. See what I'm saying? Yeah, I got you. Okay. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Meineke. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, good. Thank you, Dr. Monarchy, for an outstanding presentation. Ladies and gentlemen, it's been great having you here. Thanks for being here and have a great evening.